before we go. go. Okay. Um, like I said, my, my name is Drew. I'm one of our MBAs. I've been with uh, American Income for five and a half years now, so about 50% vested, right? Um, I've been with Tommy his my whole entire career. I started out in Pittsburgh with him, um, moved out to Philly to open up the office in Philly with Casey, and then um, got the opportunity about a year and a half ago to move out here and start everything up again. So um, I, I don't think there's a better area to do it. This is a, a very union-based area. Um, so I think we made all, all made the right decisions. So, um, but today, guys, um, we're going to go over all the no-cost benefits. So a big, you know, one-third of the presentation is going over the no-cost benefits for our members, okay? First thing I want you guys to realize is there's no money to be made in no-cost benefits. Like, I don't want you to go out there and be a no-cost delivery person. There's no money in that, right? Now, I don't want you to think that I should go through the no cost and fly through it. That's, that's not what I'm saying. All I'm saying is the main focus is to help these people out with life insurance, right? So the no cost benefits are just kind of adding on and building up our company, right? The reason we have the no cost benefits are to you know, give our members a little bit of extra incentive, right? Think, things that other companies don't do, right? It builds up a value, the value with our company. All right. And then the other reason we go over the no cost benefits is, is to gather a little bit of information on them without having to dig and pry and ask questions. So it's kind of an easy, effective way to, to get, get them to like you and to talk to you without having to like batter them with questions back and forth, you know? Exactly. So now there are, there's about five different no cost benefits. And I want you to realize not every member is going to get every no cost benefit. Right. So if we're sitting down with a union member, typically they're going to get their accidental policy that they have. They're going to have some child safety kits, the family information guide. Right. And then they're also going to have access to the AIL plus card. Now, if it's a will kit presentation, they won't have the AD and D certificate, but they'll have the will kit. If it's a child safe, no AD and D, but you know, they, they'll have, they'll have, you know, the, the child safety kits. Right. Um, so there's about, there's about four, you know, four, we say four no cost benefits, but there's five. The last no cost benefit is that needs analysis for them, kind of like the financial advisor. Um, and we'll, we'll get into that, you know, the, in, in another training class, right? So not too concerned about the needs analysis. I'm more concerned about going over all the no cost benefits with them, okay? So now the way that I teach no cost benefits is maybe not the way that everyone does it. But let me just tell you a little bit of psychology behind the way that I do it, all right? So when you're going over the no-cost benefits, I like to go from least about life insurance to most about life insurance because it makes a good, smooth transition for them or least intrusive information to most intrusive information, if that makes sense. Get them comfortable with you, and then you can ask the hard questions, right? Now, the no cost benefits themselves, like I said, they're not going to bring you any direct money, but what they will bring you is trust, right? They're also going to bring you um, control, control and referrals and referrals. Those three things right there are a reason, you know, one of the main reasons we go over the no cost benefits with them, right? So each one of the no cost benefits can be broken down into kind of three sections. This, and, and like kind of three things to do in a no cost benefit. If you hit every one of them, you know you can go past it, All right? So the first thing you always wanna do with a no cost benefit is make it important. Can you guys see that handwriting? Is that clear enough? Yes, sir. Okay, good. Uh, so make it important. Why do they need this, right? If, and it all starts with this, because if they don't see a need for it, they're not going to re refer anybody else to, to need it, right? So you got to build up the value, make, make it a reason why they need it. And, and what I want to put beside this is excitement. You got to be enthusiastic about it. You got to like the benefits yourself, right? Sales is a transfer of belief. If you believe that this has something to do with their family and it's going to help them out, then they're going to believe the same thing too, right? 
So first thing you want to do is make it important to them. Second thing you want to do is you want to explain it. Explain and answer questions. Right? Walk them through how it works. Some of the no-cost benefits are pretty simple. They take two to three minutes. The will kit takes 10 to 15, right? Now, if they have questions about it, it might take a little bit longer as well. But don't be afraid of questions. They're asking you questions because they want to know something. You're, you get a chance to, to, to show them your expertise, right? It's a really good way to build control with somebody is to show them that you know more than they do. They'll trust you at that point, right? And if you look at myself, I'm not an overbearing force. I'm not that big, right? I don't have you know, that much energy, that much, um, I, I wanna say excitement all the time. But what I do have that most people don't have is I have a big knowledge base. I know more than a lot of people do. So I use that to my advantage and I build control that way, that they trust everything I say, right? So, and then the third thing that you're gonna do is, is like Nicole said, collect referrals. And this is the biggest thing about it right here, right? With referrals, everybody's got different numbers, but if you get five referrals out of every single home, right? And you do, you know, three presentations a day, that's 15 referrals a day over four field days. That's 60 new people that you get to see the next week. You just made your whole, yourself a whole new lead pack. The agency where I came from, you got 60 leads a month. That's what you got for a month. So if I wanted to be successful, I had to go out and I had to make that 60 turn to 200 or, or 300, right? And when I moved out to Philly to help open that, that office there, we were working on year old, two year old child safety kits. They requested them two years ago, right? So my point at that, my, my job at that point was a lot harder. So what I did to make my job easier is I collected referrals from the people I did sit down with, give me fresh new people to go see, right? So I'm gonna kind of walk you guys through all the no cost benefits now. Um, you guys should all have them. If you don't get with your MGA and they will send them out to you guys, okay? Uh, either you've, you've probably seen, hopefully everyone here has been in a presentation, a live presentation. Yes. Not me. Not me yet, man. Not you met yet, Mo. Okay. Uh, I've seen I've seen a couple of presentation of uh, Matt Hansberger and events and all that, but I haven't been in a live sale yet. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I mean, mostly everybody has has seen you know a live presentation. Um, the first no cost benefit I go over with them is always the child safety kits. Always. Right. And the. I want you guys to like your wordplay to go to transition from each benefit should kind of be the same thing. The next benefit they have set up for you, the first benefit they have set up for you. Who's they? The union. Doesn't matter who they is. I want you guys to realize that. Put everything on the system. What they have us doing, you know, what they suggest. All right? It, it's it's an easy way to take the blame off yourself and put it on somebody else. Yeah, they just have us making sure we get 10 referrals out of every, every house we sit down with, All right? So, but the child safety kits, guys, this is probably one of my favorite things to go over with people. Um, a lot of parents out there have, have kids, you know, a lot of families have kids. You're gonna run into almost every single one of our members either has kids or knows somebody with kids. The introduction for the child safety kits, making it important to them, this is just letting them know some stats, right? So some, some couple, couple brief stats, you know, last year, 450, close to 500,000 children went missing or went uh, got abducted in the United States. Half a million kids, it's a lot, right? Now, the scary fact there is that if those kids don't come home in the first 24 hours, 93% of the time, they don't come home at all. So if they're not home in the first 24 hours, there's a 7% chance that they come home. That's crazy, crazy. 
right? And in Illinois, where we're serving our members at, Illinois is ranked number nine for worst spots in the United States for child abductions. They're nine. Some people here are from Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania's five, right? So it's very, very vitally important that we get these out to every parent in the community. Why this was designed is it takes the sharpest parent or grandparent four to six hours to give the police everything they need. Because if something happens, we got to remember, they're not thinking about height, weight, eye color, hair color. They're thinking, who am I with? Who are they with? Where could they be at? If they're old enough, why aren't they answering their cell phone? Right? They're panicking. You ever been in a panic state where like the smallest things seem like the biggest obstacles? That's, that's common. It happens to everybody. Right? Now just imagine if that's your kid. Right? The panic's going to be way, way higher. Right? I don't know if, if any of you guys are parents out here, use an example with them. I'm sure you had a time in your life where you were maybe at the grocery store, you know, your kid was hanging out, you know, beside you on the cart. You went to go grab your wallet out of your purse. You put your card into the car machine and then you put your card down and the kid was gone. That took 30 seconds. Gone. Right now, now keep in mind that kid might have just wandered off two or three feet down the road. But the fact of the matter is those 30 seconds it took you to realize where the kid's gone, that felt like an hour. You're panicking. And I'm guilty of this. I grew up with five other brothers. When my mom used to take us to like shopping, we would all just split up right off the bat and just go run and hang out in clothes racks and everything. So I know this still happens, guys. Right? I can still remember my mom telling me when we went to the grocery store. Like imagine, imagine my mom walking in a grocery store with five boys hanging out on the carts. Do you think we always hung out in the cart? No, very rarely, very rarely, right? So if it happened in my life, I know it happens in everybody else's life. So it's a very common theme, right? So why the kits were designed is it saves that, that four to six hours of looking for information. It's already right here, right? Now, why that four to six hours is important is because every single minute that the child is away from the home is another mile they could be further away, right? And where we're at in Des Plaines right now in, in Illinois, if something happens to the kid, if he's taken, they could be in three different states in two hours close to four different states. Pennsylvania and Pittsburgh is worse. They can be in about five different states in an hour. So that's why the kits are designed to get this information to the police very, very rapidly, right? So after I kind of make it important to them, right? Usually the first thing I say to them is I say, now Mary and Joe, these are your child safety kits, right? I'm sure you guys know some people with kids, right? And they'll say, yeah. Right, really, the child safety kits kind of starts from the introduction, getting to know about their family a little bit. They have kids, right? They have brothers and sisters. We want to know about their family. Is that the kids in sports? What are they playing? Baseball, Perfect. Or softball, soccer. You know, they have 10, 15, 20 people, kids that, that they're associated with. Exactly. Right. So that rapport we're building with them, what we're doing is we're, we're, we're bringing the low hanging fruit down so that when we're asking for referrals, we know what fruit to pick first. Right. But I'll get to the referrals in a second. Now, after you make it important to them, you got to make sure that you make it relevant to them, too, as well. So if they have kids. A great thing to do is get their kid's name. If you don't know their kid's name, all you got to say is, OK, so Mary and Joe, the first part of your child safety kit, you're going to put your kid's name on the front there. W what's one of your kids names, for example? And they'll tell you the kid's name, right? If the kid's name is Marcus, right? You're going to put Marcus on the front there and then the, the date it's completed on. Now, you guys can see here, there is a seal right there. That seal is for the International Police Association, right? They wouldn't have that seal on there if it wasn't an important thing for them to, to give out to the community, right? They wouldn't just throw that seal on there. So... And I, I make note of that too. I kind of circle it when I, when, I, when I show it to them. Like this is endorsed by the international police unions, right? But you're gonna throw Marcus's name on the front there and then the date is completed on. On the inside is where all of the kids' information is gonna go, right? 
and I just walk them one through five. Pretty easy. Number one, this is where you're going to put all Marcus's permanent information. So anything that's going to change, like the height, the weight, the eye color, hair color, you'll put that in pencil. That way you can erase it and change it. Anything that's going to stay the same, like the name, birth date, social, medications, things like that, you put that in a pen, right? Number two is a physical description of Marcus. Anything that makes him unique, glasses, braces, scars, birthmarks, right? You mark it on a little character, a little figure here, and then write a little description of it right there, All right? Uh, now, number three is a DNA sample. Now, this is where I like to have a little bit of fun with the parents. Like, you want to make this, this part fun here. You want to make it exciting. Get them to laugh a little bit, right? So what I usually say is, I say, Mary and Joe, I'm sure your kids are, are never bad, right? And they're like, never bad? Are you kidding me? They'll do that almost every time. I can, I can guarantee it, guys. If they have kids, they know their kids are bad at some time, at some points, right? So I say, Mary and Joe, I'm sure your kids are never bad, right? And they're like, yeah, never. I'm like, okay. Next time they're being bad, instead of grabbing their whole head of hair, just pluck one or two hairs out and you could tape it down here for DNA. And then they giggle. They're like, oh, okay, that's cool. We could do that, right? Now, I know some kids have little, like, short hair. For instance, you know, my mom used to grab our hair when we were kids. We all got smart about the age of 10, 11, 12. We all shaved our heads off. We all had buzz cuts. So she couldn't grab our hair anymore. But moms are creative. They'll figure out a way to punish their kids. She started grabbing our ears instead, right? So if, if the kids don't have long hair, you can also use fingernails. Your fingernails have DNA in them as well, right? So I want you guys to realize though that the DNA is not permanent. It's not gonna be there forever. DNA lasts about six to eight months, right? So I suggest either taping it down with a piece of tape or if you guys have ever gotten a new suit or a new jacket or a new blouse, it usually comes with a bag with some buttons on it in it. Use that small plastic bag. It works perfect. All right. So hair follicle or fingernails, six to eight months is when you have to update it. All right. Section number four. This is where they would put all of their fingerprints on there. All right. There's a spot for each one of the fingerprints. Now, each one of these kits comes with a police grade ink strip. All right. The ink strip is non-toxic. It will never harm them, but it is extremely messy. And now I mean extremely messy. All it does is you can see this right here. There's a little clear tab on it, right? You just pop the clear tab open and it pops right like that. And all I have to do is touch each finger and then put it on the corresponding spot. You don't have to roll it. You don't have to tap it very hard. Just touch each finger and put it on there, right? I know this is permanent ink, guys because I did this with my brother four years ago. He thought it was a joke and thought it wasn't permanent. So he put his finger on it and put a mark on the middle of his kitchen table. That mark is still on his kitchen table. Now his wife's very smart and got a table runner so you can't really see it, right? But I know it's there. I've been over his house, I know it's there. So I want you guys to realize it's permanent on surfaces, walls, furniture, clothing. What I recommend our members doing is doing this either before bath time or outside on the porch when it's nice. Either way works. Like put it put newspaper down, paper towels down, something like that. I just I, I don't tell them what to do. I just them, give them recommendations. I just tell them, hey, this is permanent ink. It will come off their skin because we have oil in our skins, but it will not come off your couch, your table, your walls. All right. So, and I joke around with them a little bit here too. I say, I used, to, I used to own a painting company. Um, I don't want to call six to eight weeks from now saying, Drew, you have to come out and repaint my walls because my kids have fingerprints all over them. All right? And then they giggle a little bit. All right? But the fact of the matter is it is permanent, guys. Just let them know that. Okay. And then I ask them at that point, I said, do you have any questions on the inside and how it all works? And they tell me no. All right. Then on the back is a section number five. This is a spot for a photo ID of the child. All right, I always tell parents, I'm sure you got a million photos of your child laying around. You're going to get a million more down the road. Cut one out, tape it down about every six to eight months. School photos work the best here because they're usually in HD and it's just a kid. 
They don't want any group photos, no party photos, nobody photo bombing it in the back. All they want is a headshot of the child, right? And again, keep this updated about every six to eight months as well. Right now, if the parents say something like, I don't have any photos of my child, which you probably won't get. Yes, they do. They have them in their phone. All they gotta do is take their phone to Walmart, plug it into the machine, print out a photo, it costs a dollar. I've done it many times, right? Um, usually when, we, when I was in the home with people, I would take pictures with my clients and I would go to Walmart, I'd print the picture out and I'd send it to the, the picture to them in their thank you card, right? So I know that that system works. I know you can do it. And then once you get done with telling them about the photo, the age of the kid in the photo, date the photo was taken. Put that in pencil so you can update it. Now, on the, in the middle here, I know there's, there's, reading, there's writing you guys can't read, but this is just important tips for parents. You know, the first one, basically stranger danger, teaching them not to, you know, go to anybody they don't know, making sure they know their, their name, their phone number, their address if they get lost. The one important one I go over with them every time is the third one, though. It says that you shouldn't put their name on a backpack or a lunchbox or a jacket or anything like that. Only reason why we have that on there is because a lot of teachers, they want the kids to have their name on something because they have 40 kids. There's 40 cubbies, right? They're trying to put all these book bags and jackets in each kid's cubby. It helps to have a, a name associated with it. Maybe put it on the inside of the jacket. What we recommend is like on the inside of a backpack or a colored piece of tape or a sticker or initials. Something that's, you know, really easy. Because to be honest, when you, when you have a newborn, when you have a kid, the first thing you teach them to say and write is typically their name, right? So they know their name. Now, if little Johnny's leaving school and some guy says, hey, Johnny, your mom told me to come pick you up out of school today. She's not going to be here. Hop in my van. At that point, kids are very gullible. He knows my name. He must know my mom. Okay. He walks right in there. That's all it takes. That's all it takes. So not even having that on the backpack or any identifying features will, will prevent that 100%. All right. Um, so that's the main one I go over with them on the back there. And then once I get done explaining how it works, I ask them if they have any questions. stickers on the back of your car no they definitely not soccer or they got this he was like because people see that they know that you take them to van or they know that you take them over here and they'll cry on yeah they know they know where you're going to be at yeah 100 percent. that's 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 great you know I, I didn't even think about that that's 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 great how was your daughter 23 weeks that's awesome man congratulations what's her name abigail abigail love it you don't hear that name anymore I love Especially it. Especially if somebody told me they were like, because they know that I, you know, I always speak highly or whatever, and they were like, that. I know your nephew's really good at football. They were like, tell your brother to get that off the back of his truck. Yeah. They it's... were like, that type of things. Granted, he's 14 years old, but yeah. still, that's the doorway. Anytime that. someone can pinpoint a location, it's not right. good. You're right, 100%. Um, but I mean, at, at that point, I just kind of ask them if they have any other questions. Usually, they don't have questions. Um, this is a pretty thing, pretty easy thing to go over with them. Usually they don't have any questions. Um, and I say, you know, that, that the child safety kit makes sense to you guys, right? You can see why they, why they designed it, right? You always want to throw a couple little tie downs in there to make them say yes, right? So remember your tie downs. You always want to get very small yeses during this part of the presentation. So that at the end, when you tell them to go get their checkbook, they're like, yeah, okay, you know? Small little psychology behind this stuff, right? So when I ask them if they don't have any questions, I'm like, okay, great guys. So this is actually the part where the police and the firefighters, this is where they need your help. So they're not asking for any monetary donations, so we don't have to worry about that. But what they are asking is that you do your part in the community by sponsoring a minimum of 10 of your closest family members and friends to receive their kits at no cost as well, right? And at that point, I take the low-hanging fruit. I take one person that I know that we talked about and, and, and make them the first referral. I already do it, All right? So I would say, you know, if I sat down with Joe and Mary, I would say, Joe, I know that your, you know, your sister, uh, Lisa, ha has two kids herself. 
you know, you told me she has two kids. So let's start with her. Now, Lisa, is she a seven, is she a 773 or is she a 312 number? Right? Boom. Like giving them the area code will, will like jumpstart them to do this. That's a little tip there. Oh, did, does their number start with a, a 773 or a 312 or 847? Whatever the, whatever, whatever, the, whatever the other number in Illinois is. I think it's 847. Um, but starting them out, you have to do that. You have to pick one person or one low hanging fruit that you know has kids and start with that. You have to get them started. Not, I mean, now you're going to run into some people who are like, oh yeah, this is great. I, I got this person, this person, this person, this person. They'll give you 15 people. But for the average person we sit down with, you're going to have to start them out, right? Now, the one thing I, I want you to make sure you, you tell them is that you have 10 spots available to get these child safety kits out to everybody. You have 10 spots. The reason I say 10 is people will generally give you half of what you ask for. So if I want, if I want five, I'm going to ask for 10. If I want 10, I'm going to ask for 20, right? Keep that in mind. Now, when you get to that point and they're like, oh yeah, you know, I, I, don't, I don't really know anybody. I'm, I'm a kind of a shut in, you know? Well, okay, your kids do any kind of sports? They can play any, any after school activities? You know, all you want to do at that point is throw suggestions out there. Right, you're right. Like if, if their son plays baseball, he can't play baseball himself. There's eight other kids on the field with them. Maybe nine if they're in Little League. I think they still do four in the outfield, right? There's nine other kids on that team, at least, at least. They got to be parent. They got to be friends of one of those parents. Got to be, you know, and I, I can be, I'm going to be honest with you guys. My childhood friends who are still my friends to this day, I talk to on a daily, weekly basis are all the kids I played baseball with when I was a kid. Those are the only friend group that I like consistently talk to on a day-to-day -day basis. So the bond over kids and sports is really there. You know, like when most families are looking to have their kids go out and play dates and things like that, they make sure that they have the same general activities that they, that they go together with. So use that stuff. Use that as examples and suggestions for them. They're, like I said, they're not going to just give you and open up their phone book and give you everyone. But if you ask the way that the script is designed, the, the, if you say the script word for word, it's going to work. I can honestly tell you it will. When you mess things up in the script and you replace words that aren't there, then that's when they're like, oh, I don't know anybody, you know? So I want you to realize the psychology behind giving them suggestions though. So I'm sure you guys have all used Google before to search for something, right? Now, if I go to Google and I type in cars, there's gonna be 50,000 different cars and 50,000 different colors make, makes models years, right? Now, if I type in red cars, all red cars are going to come up. If I type in red Ford Mustangs, red Ford Mustangs are going to come up. If I type in the year, the make, the model, and the color, it's more specific, right? That's what we got to do. When we're just asking them for referrals, it's like I'm Googling cars. But now I'm asking them, oh, do, 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 do you, your, your kid goes to, to ballet practice? Yes. Okay, who, who, does she, who does she hang out with the most at ballet? I'm sure, I'm sure their kids have been over your house a couple times too, right? Well, let's start with them. Let's make sure their parents get some child safety kids. Neighbors. Yes, 100%. And what you're going to get is people are like, oh, you know, I, I got to check with them first and then I'll, I'll get back to you on that. What they're saying is they're not going to give you anybody. So, yes. I never, at that point, if they're like, oh, you know, I would feel more comfortable just talking to them first, right? There's a method, it's called the feel, felt, found method, right? Feel, felt, found. And this doesn't, the, the, this doesn't just work for referrals. This works for a lot of things in life. So, if I was role playing this, if I was doing this with somebody in the house and they were like, yeah, Drew, I, I want to, you know, I want to talk to them first before I give you anybody to go see. I got, I completely understand that. I, I, I get you. I understand that. Um, you know, I understand how you feel. 
you know, empathize with them, get down to their level. I understand how you guys feel, right? And, and to be honest with you, you're not the only member that ever felt that way. So including them, you're not the only member that ever felt that way. Because no one wants to be the only person that feels like that. They all want to make sure that they're included with a group of people, right? So I'm sure, I'm sure you know, I understand how you feel, Mary and Joe. You know, you know, not, not given, you know, the, the numbers from your friends there. I understand that. Yep. Um, you know, and to be honest with you, you're not the only member that ever felt that way. But actually what we found out through doing this is the most effective way to get these child safety kits into the parents' hands that need them is for parents to sponsor other parents into the program. Right. So, so who do you know that, that has some little kids? Right. You can just ask them again right then and there after that. And at that point, that'll, that'll typically change their mind about things, you know? Now, it's not going to work on everybody, right? But using that method will get them to understand why you're doing it this way. Does that make sense? Now, if it's a referral, if you sat down, if you're sitting down with a referral, someone that was referred into the program, and they were referred in with the Child Safe program, make it a requirement. The only way that we can get these kits out to you is that if you refer 10 people, just like you were referred into the program, the only way that you can get these out to you is if you refer other people into the program, right? Just some, just some ways to, to collect referrals off that point there. Um, but the most effective way is just say what's in the script, to be 100% honest with you. Say what's in the script and go with it. Giving them recommendations, taking the first person and, and kind of going with that point, right? Now, once you get that first person down there on the, on, on the list, you've got to coach them up to get to 10. Okay, Joe, you got one down, you got nine spots left, who's next? Oh, you got, you got five down, you got five more spots, who else we got left? Five more plates, five more people we got to get out to. Right, high energy at that point. If you go and get kind of like antsy, then you just back away a little bit and try to come back to it? Uh, good question. Um, <clears throat> Typically not. Yeah, if they're, if they're at that point, I'm like, okay, yeah, we can, we can go over the other ones. But to be honest, I would rather spend 10 minutes with them doing this in the home and collecting 10 referrals than spending three hours on the phone to try to set appointments. You're taking 10 minutes for better appointments. So I would never not take the time to do that stuff, right? Something that helped me a lot to get started with referrals is making it fun for them, making it a game almost. You can do this. You can say, Mary and Joe, you know, we're having a contest here at the office and the person who gets the most child safety kits out to the community this week gets to have a steak dinner with the, with the, state, with the uh, state director, Mr. Vina. Put it on them, right? I, what I used to do and and it really only works if you're in home. What I used to do is I would go, before my sits, I would go to the gas station because I was always there anyway. And I would get five $1 scratch off lottery tickets for the day. And I would tell people, if you get all 10 of these spots filled up, the company gives, lets me give you, um, you know, uh, 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 enter into a chance to win $1,000 or whatever the hell it says on the top of the lottery ticket. And then once they give me 10, I give them the lottery ticket. Hey, Drew. Is, the, is that even like legal? Because I know the state exam, they said that you can, you're not supposed to bribe them or anything like that. Yeah, that's not, that's not, a, you're not, you're not paying them to get life insurance. So that's, that's not illegal. You're giving them a chance to win a prize. You're not paying them any money. You're giving them a chance to. I hear you. You can. I've, I've had agents do it. Send it to them in the packet. Um, but what I'm really getting at is incentivizing, incentivizing them to do this, you know, either incentivizing them to do it for you because you're going to win a contest at work or something like that to help you out or to incentivize it to help the community out, to be honest with you. Remember their lines to do your part in the community, right? What the police and firefighters ask is that you do your part in the community. Hey, Drew, so if, they, if they're not referring anybody, they're not doing their part in the community, right? Right. So, um, any do you guys have any questions on the child safety kits at all? Um, I don't. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just wanted to ask: What if they win the lottery? Would that be connected to you in any way? Like, whoa, 
you you bribe somebody, you know. No, if, if they went on if they went on that lottery ticket right then and there, they better get some life insurance. That's for damn sure. <laughs> right, I hear you, man. I've, I've had I've had one I have one lady win two hundred bucks in front of me before. Really? Wow. Nice. Was she happy? She was really happy. She's really happy. She she and she got policies on all of her kids. So, at that point. Like I said, incentivizing them helps. Making it fun helps. Um, you got to get excited about this. Like your energy level has to be really high when you're talking about the child safety kits. If you guys are parents, use, use your experiences. Story sell. Throw a little bit of yourself in there as well. Um, what I would recommend too is if you have kids, get one of these and fill them out for your kids and show them on the screen that you filled it out for your kid. That's just me. That's just, that's just your belief level transferring over to their belief level. Right. An extra step. Now, if you don't have kids, you can't do it. Don't worry. Can, Maybe use a, a nephew or a niece or something like that. Or you could use can, can you do this virtually? Like you tell them, Hey guys, if you fill in these 10 spots, I'll make sure to put some, uh, you know, cards in there just so you guys can enter the chance of winning a hundred dollars or $200. Yeah, you can do that. You can, you can throw the, 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 the cards in there virtually. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. All right. And anybody else got any questions on the child safety kits? All right. Anybody here? You forgot to mention that uh, if you need a new kit, you can call the office or reach out to your right. Kit You're right. Hundred percent right. So, very very good. Now, and I wanted to bring that up too because sometimes people are be like, "Oh, I don't know anybody off the top of my head." Of course you don't. I don't know anybody off the top of my head either. But guess where I do know people from? This little square thing in my pocket. Your phone. Nobody knows phone numbers anymore. I remember, I remember calling phone numbers before you have to have an area code on it. Right? I used to know all my friends' phone numbers. I used to know them all. But somewhere down the line, when I can just touch a name or a face and, and call, that memory went away. Your brain makes space for things that are important. Knowing phone numbers is not very important because it's always in your pocket, right? And and that's a very good point. What I, and, and that's usually what I bring up after I go over the questions, you know, the important tips for parents. Because at the bottom down here, I don't know if you guys can see it, there's a phone number. It's a 1-800 number. What I have them do, I say, no, no, no questions, we're good. Perfect. Okay, so, um, you know, there's actually a phone number on the bottom here. So go do me a favor really quickly. Go ahead and grab your cell phone. And then they go and grab their cell phone. What you're going to do is you're going to put you're going to start a new contact and you're going to save it as child safety kits or like i don't know child safe id something like that and then you're going to put the number 1-800-742-6783 in there and if something happens to the kits you damage them you lose them you need more down the road all you have to do is call that phone number and then they'll send more kits out to you right and then right after that i go now, this is where the police and firefighters ask for your help. They're not asking for any monetary donations, right? What this does is it gets their cell phone in their hands. So when they tell me, I don't know anybody. Oh, you know that little cell phone you have? Go ahead and grab that out. Or you can say, you know, what most people do is they actually just go through their phone and they go through their contact list A through Z so they don't miss anybody. So why don't you go ahead and grab your phone and uh, we can start at A and work all the way through the Zs. That, makes sure, that way we make sure we don't miss anybody. That's, I'm glad you brought that up. I did miss that. Thank you. Um, getting their phone into their hands is crucial because this is where all their contacts are. Right? So make sure that their, their phone's in their hands. Now, you might with, meet with some people that are on Zoom on their phone. Yeah. Is that the, that's the question? Yeah, that was going to be my exact question. I was going to say, what if they, they're on Zoom and they can't get to their contact list on their phone because they're using their phone? It's Paul, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yes, if they're on their phone and they're using zoom, mm -hmm. they can back out of zoom and they'll still be on the screen. Well, they won't be on the screen. Their name will be up there, but you can still yeah. hear them. It, won't, it okay. won't exit out of zoom. Zoom's a really weird app to where if you don't close the meeting, it'll always be open. Okay. I've had members be in meetings for three, four hours <clears> after <throat> the meeting they brought to close out zoom. Okay. <laughs> so they can actually just pop into their phone go into their contact list with you on Zoom and they can read off the numbers. Okay. Just, just tell them that. And they're yeah. like, oh, okay, really? No, go, no, go do it. All right. The reason, okay. now there's two, like I said, there's two reasons to grab their phone. Number one, because the contacts are in there. 
And number two, this builds a little bit of control. You're telling them to do something for you. Control actually starts on the phone call when you're telling them to go get the piece of paper and write stuff down. That's the beginning of control. This is just moving it along time the system so that when you tell them, hey, I need you to go get your checkbook and your ID and your medications, they're like, all right, cool, and then just go do it, right? But if you don't build any control, asking them to go do those things, it seems like a very monumental task. But if you do it and you have them build control through the whole presentation, it's, it's super simple to ask that question. Can you hear me? <laughs> I, I did that. All right. We, can you hear me? Can you see me? We, I did that with Mo earlier today. <laughs> um, all right. So anybody got anybody else got any questions on the um, the child safety kits? Nope. Good. Yeah, you can do that too. And, and, and at the end too, at the end of the meeting, you can just go back to it. Hey, you remember how we went over the child safe program? Is there anybody you know now that after we went through everything that you want to recommend? Yep, definitely good, Nicole, definitely good. All right, so if we're, if we're done there, the next benefit that I go over with them is the AIL Plus card. So I just have a printout of it right now. Um, there's not an actual physical card on our slideshow, we have the, the, the card and the breakdown of the percentages and everything like that. Um, this is probably the quickest no cost benefit you're gonna go through just because there's not much involved with it. Basic, the, the basics of it, making it important to them. So the reason we designed this guys is because a lot of our members are quitting, firing, retiring and they have, they're losing their benefits. This is a way to make sure they still have some benefits even if they quit, fire, retire, right? And this card, I want you, I want, the first thing I usually tell them, I want you guys to realize that this is not insurance. This is not gonna replace their current health insurance. This is gonna work above and beyond their insurance. So it takes care of anything they pay out of pocket for. And this works at the eye doctor. This works at the dentist, the audiologist. This works at your, your primary care physician. This works at pharmacies. Right? There's thousands of locations nationwide that, that, that accept this card. Now, everyone in this is, is brand new. And August last year is when they came out with this, this new discount card. It used to be just called like the A, it was, it was called like American Income Partners card or something like that. But they spent the last three years and a couple million dollars developing this to make it better for all of our members. The discounts used to be like 10 to 35%. Some of them now are 10 to 85%. Right? And I know in our PowerPoint, we have a breakdown of almost everything on there. So typically at this point, the only thing I really want to know about them is if they take medications. So I asked them, I asked Mary and Joe, do you guys take any, any kind of like medications or anything like that? You guys take a lot of prescription medications? And if they say yes, I'm like, okay, I know down the road, probably gonna have to answer some medical questions, right? But if they say no, I'm like, okay, they're, you're in good health, we're good to go. I know that I can go down the road comfortably and pitch them options, you know? And you said you, uh, if you have a lot of prescriptions, you can take advantage of the mailing services. Yeah. I'm afraid you're still going to the public right now because of the coronavirus. 100%. It's a great option that you can use. It's going to save you some money, put it back in your pocket. And if they're not sick, then you just say, hey, I'll just go to the dentist two times a year for cleanup. Boom. We can use that. Exactly. So... People will, now it, it, it works at a th like thousands of different locations. And the way it works is it's provider based. So the provider accepts the discount, not our company, right? So it works, I mean, just some, some, some quick places it'll work at, CVS, Rite Aid, Walgreens, Target, um, America's Best for glasses, um, Humana for dental, um, there's thousands of independent locations. So the great thing about the card now is it's actually an app on your phone. So you guys can download this, they can download this. If you just go to the Google Play Store or the Apple App Store, it's just called AIL Plus. And once they download it, the next thing it's gonna ask is, is for a username and a password. Once we get done with the meeting, on top of the needs analysis is where we plug that information in. Once we get done with the meeting, it gets sent to home office, and then in two to three days, they get an email that says, welcome to the AIL Plus program. Here's your username and your password. And then they use that to log in. Uh, what right. if, um, 
Oh, sorry, don't mean to interrupt, but a, a lot of uh, the potential clients are much older and like they don't have a phone. And so there isn't a physical card for this is what you're saying. Good question. Very good question. And what, what was your name? Sorry. Takira. 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 Um, so Takira, we, I have this printout. I send this in every one of my packages to my members just in case they don't have that. On this, it, on here, there's a phone number they can call and a website they can go to to get information on how to get the physical card sent to them. Oh, okay. So I send so this there, there out is, to everyone okay. so they look at it. Okay. Right. Um, but it is designed to work on your phone. Um, it, it's just easier. Everyone has their phone on them at all times. Right. And, and um, I don't hey, know how well, many of you guys. I've got, the, I've got the email. Do you want me to show it to everybody? There you go. Right there. Can you guys so see that? To the AIL Plus program, and it'll have your username and your password in it. Pretty simple, you right? Have no, you can, it works on Android as well. Yep, works on both, so we're good there. Um, now, when when you pull up the actual app itself, it'll have like a um, like a like a My Wallet feature where it'll have like the location of the places you visit. It'll have a map of all the places in the area that accept the card. It'll save your discounts. It'll save your prescriptions. Um, but the point you want to get across to them is that this takes care of anything you pay out of pocket for. So I, I, are a lot of people here in, in Illinois? Yeah. Okay. So I'm sure you guys know what Jewel Osco is, right? If you don't, um, if you're from Pittsburgh, you know what Giant Eagle is, right? Right. So what I'm getting at is they have what's called an advantage program or, or like some kind of discount card where all you do is you put your phone number in and it saves you money right off the top. Like you don't have to apply for them. You just scan the item. And if it's, if it can save you money, it saves you money. That's the exact way this works. So they don't have to fill out paperwork. All they do is show the card. And if they can accept the discounts, they get it right off the top. All right. Now, what I want you guys to do when you're sitting down with our members is if, like I said, ask that question. Now, do you guys take any, any kind of prescription medications or anything like that? They say no, go with it. They say yes, okay, great, this can help you out. What I usually do is I have glasses on my face and I wear them all the time. A lot of our members have glasses too. Mention that to them. So I see you wear glasses, Joe. This will actually help save you anywhere from 20 to 60% of your replacement glasses or contacts. Make it real to them, right? Put them inside the picture, right? So explanation of it is pretty simple. Right, it's nothing too crazy. Just let them know that this works above and beyond their current medic medical um, insurance, and it's provider based, which means the provider accepts the discount, not our company. What do you think the average of someone saves with that though? Good question. Actually, they just came out with stats about a month ago, and because it was like for six months, they were like, we want to see how how effective this program is with our members. The average member that used this card save between three to six hundred dollars it's not bad All right i can tell you guys this card 100 percent works the glasses on my face i got in december i saved 50 bucks on them use it you guys can use it too and get with your mga he'll show you how to fill it out and, and get and get the actual card itself it's not too difficult um and then the last thing is referrals from that right so collecting referrals from this part should be pretty easy. What I do is I, I ask them a question. I say, Mary and Joe, do you know how union buying power works? And if they say, no, I don't. Or if they say, yes, I do, it doesn't matter. I still explain how it works. I don't care what they say. I still explain it to them. I say, yeah, so, so the way union buying power works is you know, the more people that you can get involved into a program, the more providers will get involved as well. And then the bigger discounts we'll get from those providers, right? So what I tell them, I say, this, 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 this discount program is very new. So in order to get new members, they're actually allowing you to sponsor up to five people to receive their AIL discount card as well, right? So who do you know that's not in the greatest health right now? Who do you know that just retired and can use some supplemental benefits? Who do you know that's self-employed and doesn't get any work coverage? 
Who do you know that was just laid off? Right? Throw some examples out there. This, just keep in mind when you're going over the AIL discount program, the people that are going to be interested in it are typically an older generation, people that have medical bills, right? So they're going to refer other older people into this program. Just know that. I'm not saying don't get those referrals because those people are great too. They're almost even better because sometimes they don't even have coverage and what they need costs a little bit of money. So the ALP is higher for us, right? But helping them through this and, and answering their questions, like you're, you're not gonna get too many questions on this. The main questions will get like, does it work at this place? Or does it work at this place? I, I don't know for a hundred percent fact, but when you get the app, you can check on that, right? They'll ask you, uh, does it work, you know, with like what discounts I get? So some providers will accept the biggest discount, some will accept multiple discounts, and then some will accept just one. So it's provider based, like I can't give them any kind of specific numbers to it. Does that make sense? But do you guys have any questions on the AL plus discount card? Oh, I have one question real quick. Um, someone yep. asked the other day on one of my sits, uh, I was just viewing, but she said, she asked if it covers like, like orthodontist stuff and stuff with braces. She was asking for her kids. Um, now Christina just said like check locations, but just in future, does it cover for something like that? Or is that too, uh, specific? It's a little too specific. Um, Okay. Like I said, we don't know what the provider accepts discount wise. They just would have to check. Okay. Um, but the good part about the card is if it can't help them, it can't hurt them. It doesn't cost them any money. Right. Okay. And, and also one card will take care of an entire family. Okay. So they don't have to get separate cards. The husband and wife can use the same app. They can use it for their kids. Um, but what I usually tell them if they have questions like, Will it cover this? Will it cover this? I'm like, you know, to be honest with you, I don't know a hundred percent, but the great thing about the card is if it can't help you, it can't hurt you. It doesn't cost you any money. Yeah. Okay. And they're like, oh, okay, it makes sense. And then it kind of just delays them from asking any more questions, you know? All right. Thank you. Um, but that was a good question. It was a good question. Anybody else got questions? Like earlier, Mo and I were talking and I said to him, you know, maybe at the end after you possibly have them enroll in an investment for their family, mm -hmm. you could express to them that, hey, this discount card is going to save you money. It's going to put back money into your pocket, which is going to help cover some of the costs, you know, throughout the year that you spent on investing into the benefits package for your family. Yeah. And you could try to like- it wouldn't, it wouldn't be bad to kind of uh, double down on it, like what you're saying. Yeah. At the end of the presentation, hey, keep in mind, you have that discount card. It's going to save you some out-of-pocket costs that, you know, you're, you're, you're investing today. Just keep that in mind. Yeah, it's not bad. Not bad at all, Seth. I like that. What was union okay. buying power again? Okay, good. Uh, so union buying power is, is the way that the program works. So the more people that we can get involved in the program, the more companies will see that those people are involved and then the more discounts that they'll give. Right? Um. The one place that this does not work, and you're going to get this, people are going to ask, does this work at Walmart? No. It will not work at Walmart. Walmart is a very anti-union company, and we do not work with Walmart. So that's a no. <laughs> um, but, but does anybody else have any questions on that, the, the AIL Plus card program at all? Good. All right, cool. So I would say the next benefit that they have set up for you is the AIL discount or the A, sorry, the AIL family information guide, right? Now the guide, when, when I send it out to them, it's folded like this, but when I talk to them on, on the page, it looks like this. It's a, it's a long pullout, right? So explaining it, making it important to them, right? So Mary and Joe, the first question I ask them I say, Mary and Joe, do you have a will or anything like that set up yet? If they say no, 
I'm like, okay, this is a great start to a will. It's not an actual will though. What it's designed to do is get your family all the information they need. So when then this time comes, they're not flipping through every piece of paper in the house to try to find it. It's really designed to get your family from passing to the funeral. That quick three to five day process where there's a lot going on. The last thing we want your family to do is have to flip through every piece of paper in the house to try to find this stuff, right? If they say, no, I don't have a will set up. Or if they say, yes, I do have a will set up. Great, this is gonna work hand in hand with your will. And I tell them what it's designed to do is make sure your family has all the information they need. So when you pass away, they don't have to flip through every piece of paper in the house. Right? And I just walk them through it. I honestly just walk them right through how it all works. All right, so the top part, I don't know if you guys can see it, Let me put up a little bit there. Top part says vital statistics and historical data. That's just a fancy way of saying their information. So I would say the top part, this is where you're going to put all your information, name, birthday, social, all that good stuff. The next section down, I don't know if you can see it, it says veterans information, right? Simple question. Did you guys serve? No, go, go through it. If they served, do not move forward unless you thank them for their service. Seriously, don't do it. If they say, yeah, I served, and you go on to the presentation, you just shot yourself in the leg. Like, they did something for this country. Make sure that they know that you, you, you appreciate that. It's a simple thank you for your service. I appreciate what you did for our company, or for our, or for our country, right? Super simple. I mean, I, I don't know why people don't do it. Anybody that I thank everybody for their service, man. You know, it, why not? You know, there you go, right? Uh, the next section down, it says spouses, statistics and historical data. If there is a husband and a wife, just say, see other guide. Or if they don't have one, tell them they don't got to figure it out. They don't have to fill it out. Because when we send these out, we send out one for each person. So the husband gets one and the wife gets one, right? The next section down, it says persons to be notified, right? Persons to be notified. That's where you're gonna put down for people who wanna be notified in case of an emergency. Your brother, your sister, your cousin, your aunt. What I usually tell them here is I say, now Joe, if an emergency situation, who would be your number one contact? It'd probably be Mary, right? Okay, we'll put Mary on the first line. But if something happened to you and Mary, who would you want to put down there then? And then they say, my brother, Bill. Well, I know right now that their two main beneficiaries are his wife and Bill. I know that already. So that when I'm going through the application, I could just mention that to them again. You want Bill to be the contingent beneficiary, right? Yep, okay, boom. Make your job easier. And then at the bottom of that spot there too, it says person to be in charge of final arrangements marking down who's going to take care of everything. It stops family fighting, All right? Anybody got questions on the first four sections? Pretty simple, All right? The next section down, it says last will and testament. It's right here, All right? Last will and testament section. If they have a will drawn up, tell them to put their name of the executor, their lawyer, and where the location of the will is. Think about it. If they spent all this time to develop this will, they spent this money to go to a lawyer to, to notarize and everything. What good is making sure, what, what good is having the will if your family can't find it, right? So I always tell people to make sure you know you, where, the, where the will is, all right? The next section down, the estate information section, this is by far the most important section on this whole guide. It's called the estate information section. This is where all of their life insurance is going to go. Okay. Now there's an important question I ask them here. Let me erase all this stuff here. There's one important question you have to ask them at this spot. And it has to be said this way. The question is, Mary and Joe, do you have any permanent life insurance in force right now? Mary and Joe, do you have any permanent life insurance in force right now? 
So I don't know if this blue marker works. Can you see that blue marker? Is that good? Okay. So the first way that they can answer this is yes. Second way they can answer this is yes. And then the third way they can answer this is no. The first yes. If they say yes, I, I have permanent coverage. Okay, is it, is it through work or is it outside work? That's the question you're gonna ask next. If they say yes, is it through work or outside work? If it's through work, tell them, remember, remember how I went over in the introduction with you? Anything that you get through work is not permanent. Once you quit fire or retire, it will go away. That's why we're actually out to you today. A lot of people have work coverage. They don't have anything permanent. So if they say yes, it's through work, remind them work coverage isn't permanent. So do you guys have any permanent coverage? And at that point, they'll probably say no, right? So yes, work coverage. And at that point, if they only have work coverage, on the guide itself, there's a spot down at the bottom that says group coverage and accidental hospital and accident. That on the bottom two lines is where they're gonna put their work coverage at. Now on the bottom two lines, you can see there's a spot for a company, a policy number, and then there's no spot for an amount. I tell them that, I say, okay, you're gonna put your work coverage down here. You're gonna put the company you have it through, the policy number that you have it, and then there's no spot for an amount because remember, once you quit fire retire, those benefits go away. So I'm right there letting them know, hey, it's not permanent coverage. Now, if they say, yes, Drew, I have permanent coverage and it's outside of work. Then what I do is I tell them, okay, great. Who do you have your coverage through, for example? Okay, great. You have some outside coverage. Who do you have it through, for example? I'm not just asking them, who do you have your life insurance through? I'm saying, who do you have it through, for example? Because what I'm going to tell them is I'm going to say, okay, you have State Farm. So you're going to write State Farm on the company, the policy number, and then the amount. Why do you think, why do you guys think I want to know the name of the company? Exactly. Good. But both, both people here, good answers. So what they said was, because um, I because I know the company, I know what products they sell, I know if I could beat their rates. That's what it is. It's knowledge. I'm I'm what I'm doing right here is I'm gathering ammunition that I can use down the road. So if they tell me I, I have State Farm, I'm not going to rebuttal them right then and there. Like State Farm has this, this, and this. You have this, this, and this. This isn't the time to go over their life insurance that they have. All I'm doing is figuring out who they have so that in the back of my mind, I know what they have. Because there's certain companies that sell certain products. And one thing I want you guys to take away from today, every presentation you're in, if they have life insurance through another company, write down the name of that company and your job, your homework for that night is to research that company. Look at what kind of policies they sell. That way, when someone tells you down the road, I have this company, you're like, oh, I'm familiar with what they have. You probably have this policy or this policy, right? There's no way for us as a company to show you a list of every company and every product they sell. There's no way to do it, right? But I got good at doing this because that was my homework. When I got beat by someone that had life insurance through another company and I didn't know, I went home and I looked up that company. I fall asleep many a night scrolling on my phone, looking up life insurance plans. Right? That's what it takes to get that knowledge base though. And, I, and the thing is too, is if they're like, oh, I have Primerica, you know, I, I want you guys to write that name down for sure. If you ever hear the word Primerica, Primerica, yep, P-R-I-M-E. Know that that's a 100% term life insurance company. They do not do whole life. And you're going to run into people who are very misinformed about that company. They're, very, they're a very popular company, but they do term policies and they don't really tell their members a lot of time that it's term. They just show them a big number for a small price, right? 
then I have to get into the meeting with them and I have to tell them that it's term and they get pissed off at that company, not me, right? Because all I'm doing is explaining things. I didn't get you that policy, <laughs> right? But I can explain to you what, how your policy works and, and how ours works and how it differs, you know? But the only point I'm getting across to that, yes, if outside coverage is making sure that you know the name of the company that they have it through. Okay, great, you have outside coverage. Who do you have it through, for example? State Farm, okay, you're gonna put State Farm, the policy number, and then the amount. That's all you gotta do there, all right? And then the third way they can answer the question is no, and this is the best way, right? Because we know they don't have any permanent coverage. That's why we're there, to make sure that at the end of the day, they have at least something to take care of what they need. Now, if they say, no, Drew, I don't have, we don't have any permanent coverage. What I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna say, okay, not if, but when you get some permanent coverage, cause we all need it, right? And they'll go, yeah. You're gonna put the name, so American income, the policy number, and then the amount. You see how I threw that little American income in there, AIL? Planting a little seed right there. And the whole through the presentation, we're gonna water that seed and at the end it's gonna grow. Can you repeat that right? for me, please? Sure. So if they don't have any coverage, what I would say is, okay, Mary and Joe, um, you don't have any coverage. So what you would do, uh, we, here's what I say. No, no, you don't have any coverage. Okay. Not if, but when you get some permanent coverage, because we all need it, right? You're going to put the company. So American income, the policy number, and then the amount. So that all your family has to do is call one company, give them the policy number and they can get that amount issued very quickly, all right? Now, I want you guys to, to let them know this too. The reason that we go over this in depth, this section in depth with them is because just alone last year, $1.6 billion of life insurance went unclaimed. A billion dollars. Now, do you guys know the main reason why it goes unclaimed? Boom. People don't know they have it. People are, are, are watching murder mysteries where, where husbands get killed over hundreds of thousands of dollars of life insurance and they're not putting anybody else on that, on that policy. That very rarely happens in real life, all right? What usually happens is people don't tell their family that they have life insurance. Their family forgets it. Grandma had a policy up in the attic for five years. After five years, that money goes back to the life insurance company, guys. So there's a certain amount of time they can use to make that claim. And a lot of people lose paperwork. I don't know if any of you guys have sat down with any of our policy holders. I can honestly say maybe one out of 10 I sit down with actually have their claim forms and their paperwork. People move, people change addresses, they lose stuff. It happens, right? But at least if they have it written down in here, they know their family can find it, right? Remember that 1.6 billion that goes unclaimed. We just don't want that to happen to your family, All right? So we're giving them some stats and we're helping them out with that. We're on their side with this, All right? Anybody have any questions on the estate information section? Good, okay. Next section down is financial institution information, All right? I go over this every single time with them. Because what I want to find out right now is if they have a checking account. Because if they don't have a checking account, they can't get the life insurance. What if they have a can't, can't apply with the savings. Why? Because, good question. Because most savings accounts have a limit on how many transactions you can do every month or every year. And it's like usually three or four. Six. Even six. If I pull one out every month, that's 12 months. At a certain point, the policy is going to stop because we can't pull any more money out. Right? So it's a legal thing. We can't do it. Now, what they can do is they need to start with a checking account. They can transfer it over to savings down the road if they want to, but they have to start with a checking account. So at least the first premium has to come out of their checking account every single month. They can change it to, to direct, direct billing after that, but 
in order for the company to, to make sure that they're serious about this coverage, they need to apply and pay one month up front and has to come out of that checking account auto drafted. If they want to mail, if they want to mail it in, they have to pay the first premium out of the, check. out of the checking account, and then we can put them on direct billing, and they'll get a bill mailed to their house every month. The reason we do it is because number one, they are conditionally insured as of today. They have a conditional receipt that states that if they pass away while it's going through underwriting, our company will pay up to fifty thousand up front, finish underwriting, and then pay the rest out. That's one reason. The other reason is because while this is going through underwriting, our company is paying these hospitals money to get medical records back and forth. It's not free. So the company wants to make sure you're serious about this because they're going to be sending money back and forth to these hospitals. So that's why they collect that first month, you know, uh, auto drafted from your account. Does that make sense? Um, but the reason what I asked them there, as I say, Mary and Joe, the next section down, it, it, it's banking information. So I'm sure you have a checking account and a savings account, right? And they, they're like, yeah. So, and I, and I would, sometimes I take it a step further because sometimes you'll get an answer like, uh, yeah, I have one. They probably don't. You know, if they have one, they're like, yeah, I got that. Don't worry. Right, but you're going to run into some people who don't have bank accounts. There's two things that surprised me when I first started this job. The amount of people that don't have a bank account and the amount of people that don't have full sets of teeth in their mouth. You'll see some of our union members, they're, they're trips, right? But some people just don't trust banks. And then some people have overdrafted many, many banks and they can't even get a bank account now. That's some of the issues you run into sometimes. They want a bank account, but they can't get one, right? So all I'm getting at there is if, if, if they don't have a bank account, don't stop the presentation right there. Like, oh, I'm done. See you later. Hang up Zoom, right? I want you to still go through the benefits with them, but just know at the end, hey, if you wanted to enroll into these benefits, you, the first thing you need to have is a checking account, right? And get with your MGAs and your, your, your supervisors and managers. And you, there's ways that we can get checking accounts established online, things like that if, that, if they're really serious about it, you know? But just at the end of the day, we're using this to make sure that they have a checking account. Does that make sense? All right. Uh, next section down, it's a very small section. It says safe deposit box. These are kind of being phased out now. There's not too many banks that even have safe deposit boxes anymore. Um, only thing, if you run into an older generation, they might have one. Just tell them to mark it down. One thing that goes on with a safe deposit box, not the bank, is what's called probate. If your name or your, your, if you die, like if I died and if I had a wife and her name wasn't on that, um, it would take six to eight months of, of legal work and, and, and court proceedings for her to access that money. So what they do is they lock up that account, they lock up that box. And if there's anything permanent you need like life insurance paperwork or uh, investment paperwork or stocks or bonds or anything like that, your family can't even access it for six to eight months. That's why I tell people not to put this in the safe deposit box. Keep all the important paperwork at the house. Right. But you guys shouldn't have to really worry about that too much. Not a lot of people have. Them. Right. But the last section down here at the bottom. Funeral service request is another very important section. The way I, I show this to them, as I say, Mary and Joe, the funeral service request section is probably another very important section on here. This is going to this is where you're going to put down how you want to go out. And I would say everybody's got their own way of going out whether it's a burial, a mausoleum, or cremation. Just mark it down your way. That way, no one's going to fight about it, All right? And as you can see on here, there's a bunch of different spots. There's, they could name their cemetery. They can name if they have lots purchased, if they want to wear glasses, if they want to wear their own jewelry, they want to wear some other clothing, right? There's also a spot for special instructions if they have anything unique you want done, right? So if they wanted to be, I don't know, uh, cremated and shot off into space, mummified, Viking funerals, right? There's, you're gonna meet some really cool people out there that have some really cool ways to, to go out. Everyone's their own person. So all I tell them is, if you have anything you, unique you want done, mark it down at the bottom here so that it will happen, all right? Now, at the bottom as well, there's a spot for a signature. They can sign this, date it, and get it notarized, 
and it will hold up as a legal document. Keep in mind, it's not a will. It's not designed to go through court proceedings. All it's designed to do is get your family from passing to the funeral. That quick three to five day process, right? You guys have any questions on that at all? No, nope. okay. All right, good. So the next benefit we're gonna go over with them is the A, D, and D certificate. And I'm gonna try to pull one up here on the computer. I think I have one saved. So you guys can see it. Give me one second here. Um, hey Drew, I got a quick question here. Sure. Uh, uh, so why why does it like why is it considered a free will kit or something like that? You know why? What what do you mean? Like I know it's a family information guide, but I I think at some point people were talking about it as if it's a free will as well. But no, that's that that's, that's, that's another that's, benefit. That's, that's this. Oh, that's a completely different thing. Oh, okay, yep. gotcha. Completely different. Uh, All right, so. You guys can see that um, that certificate on the screen there, right? Yeah. I know you guys can't, but it's, I mean, you can look at that or turn around. You're gonna have to turn anyway, because I have the will kit that's actually on that. Yes, 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 you have it, perfect. And I know Nicole's seen them. I know she's seen me walk through them, so we're okay. But this info certificate here, that is their actual certificate for life insurance, okay? So I tell them, okay, guys, this is your certificate. This is your no cost accidental death and dismemberment certificate. First thing I show them is these two numbers at the top here. There's an SG number and an ID number, right? The SG number, that attaches their union to American income. So everybody in the sheet metal workers 218, everybody in this union has the same SG number. The ID number is unique to that person. So the ID number attaches that person to the local union. The SG number attaches a local union to our company. Does that make sense? They need those two numbers. Then what I tell them, I said, as long as you're an active member and retiree in good standing, this policy will pay out for you. Active member means they're paying their union dues. Good standing means that when they left the union, their dues were paid and they retired in good standing. Some people don't get to retire in good standing. Most do though. <laughs> um, so this guy's benefit. Now every, now every one of the, I want you guys to realize every one of the AD and D certificates is different. There's different values for different unions. There's different members that are covered under it. Some won't cover retirees, some will, all right? But just for this instance, this is the sheet metal workers local 218. So after I tell them who the act, all, all active members and retirees in good standing, I tell them this is for the benefits for the accidental loss of your life, both hands, both feet, both eyes, one hand, one foot, one hand, one eye, one foot, one eye, right? We, we used to joke around and call that last one the pirate policy, right? Think about it. One leg, one eye, look like a pirate, right? Um, if anything in that first category happens, $3,000 would come out to Tyler if he was still alive. But if Tyler passed away, this money would come out to Emily, his wife. So it's a living benefit and a death benefit. Does that make sense, guys? Okay. Now, there's a second category as well right below that. And you can see it's for one hand, one foot, or one eye. And half that amount would come out. So if, if, if Tyler loses a hand or a foot or an eye, he's gonna get $1,500. All right, now, not enough money to go cut your hands and legs off about, right? But if, if that does happen accidentally at work or, or outside of work, that this policy would, would help pay for some of those things. All right? And at that point, I ask him, do you have any questions on what the policy covers? They'll say no. All right? Then I kind of read them off the exclusions. Keep in mind, I've been doing this for five years. I know exactly what the exclusions say. <laughs> so I usually tell them there are some exclusions to this policy, mainly suicide, sickness, voluntary taking of drugs, acts of war, committing felonies, taking part in a riot. Stuff that's really not an accident anyway. You're intentionally going to do those things, um, but they do have exclusions on them, all right? And then at the bottom, 
when we send this out to them, guys, we send everything basically from that red line up. Everything from that red line up, they get in the mail. Anything from the red line down, we keep at our, rec at our office for records. So there's a little, you, when, we, when we used to go out to the home, we used to have this on like perforated paper. So the bottom would just fold and we'd tear it off. But we keep that at our office for records to number one, make sure, yes, I did get out to that person. I have a slip. And then on the back of that slip, we also put their beneficiaries, right? So what I tell them, I say anything from that red line up, you're going to get in the, in the mail, in your package. Anything from the red line down, we keep at our office for records. So let's verify the information one more time. And I just say, Tyler, your, your current address, 2642 South Homer Lake Road in Homer, Illinois. That's still correct for you? He'll say yes. So, okay, great. Your date of birth, 8-9-1988. That's correct as well. Perfect. All right. And then you'll see a phone number in here. Sometimes the phone number will be in there. Sometimes it won't. If the phone number is in there, ask them, is that your phone number, Tyler, or is that Emily's phone number? We want Emily's phone number on there. Because if something happens to Tyler, he dies, chances of him answering his phone are zero. He's not going to answer his phone. He's dead, right? So we need the beneficiary to answer the phone. So Tyler, what's the best number for Emily? Emily's going to be sitting right there. Say, Emily, what's the best phone number to contact you? And then you write it down, All right? Now, once all that stuff is verified on the bottom there and you're good to go, I tell them one more thing. I say, now, now Emily and Tyler, guys, you know, me, you, and, and, and basically the company are, only the, are the only people that know about this policy. So what they have us do is collect the contingent beneficiary. Because if something happens to you and Tyler together, who would you want the money to go to at that point? And then they tell me their beneficiary. And I write it on the back of that, on the bottom of that certificate. So I know who their contingent beneficiary is. And guess what, guys? That's a referral right there. One referral right there. So if you're sitting down with a union member and you're not collecting at least one contingent beneficiary, you're not doing your job. I always, I typically try to get them to get two. Now, if they say, now let two contingent, two contingent beneficiaries. Yep. You, all you got to say is what, what, what they suggest is that you guys have two contingent beneficiaries set up. Not what I suggest, what they suggest, right? And, and, you always, and, and keep in mind too, if, if the first contingent beneficiary is a little kid, anybody under the 18, age of 18, you definitely need to get a backup. Mm -hmm. So you definitely got to get a backup, right? The only thing you need when you're collecting a contingent beneficiary is the person's name, the relationship, like the area that they live in, so the state, of, the state they live in, and then the phone number. I have a question. Once you have all that for both of them, you're good to go. Question. I have a question real quick. So if they yeah, put down two minors as uh, their beneficiaries, so one's their second contingent, uh, do you explain to them that they won't be able to receive the benefits or the after they're 18 years old? So, yeah, I, I don't I don't tell them they can't receive the benefits because they can. Yeah, what it's after them, after the age of 18, though. What? Yeah. What I tell them is. I, I tell them exactly what happens. So if I, if something happens and Joe dies and his kids are under 18, that money goes to his estate. Now, yeah. when the money is in your estate, the first thing that happens, it becomes taxable. So you lose 20% right off the top of it, right? The second thing that happens is if the kids are under 18, they can't even access that estate until they're 18. So if you have any money in life insurance and your family really needs it right then and there to pay for things, good luck getting access to it, right? After you're dead, you cannot change the beneficiary. You're right. And what happens a lot of the time too is if they, the family needs that money, they'll hire a law team and attorneys to access the money on the kid's behalf. But how do you think the, the law team gets paid? Out of that. So you're losing money off the top. It's taxable. Your family's not getting the money that they deserve all because you didn't nominate the right beneficiary. Now I'm not telling them that they can't name their kids as the beneficiary. I'm just showing them what's going to happen if they do name their kids and they're not here anymore. Does that make sense? It's a difference from telling them they can't do something 
showing them that why they shouldn't do something. Does that make sense, Paul? Okay, cool. Good question, man. Good question. Um, anybody have any other questions on the AD and D certificate? It's pretty easy to explain. Just keep in mind, every one of them is different. Can you actually repeat the percentage on if the kids are eight under 18, um, how much loss of that estate they would lose? It, it depends on the state, but it's typically oh. about 20%. And then there's some inheritance taxes, things like that, that go into it as well. So just know that once the money goes to your estate, it becomes taxable. That's why life insurance is, is tax-free because it's left to somebody, not your estate. Hey, Drew, um, if somebody goes out hunting and gets attacked by a bear, is that also considered an accident or not? Yes, it's considered an accident. I just want to make sure. <laughs> yep. Yep. Anything that's like anything, there's, there's a lot of things that are considered accidents nowadays. Like, to be honest, if let's say here's a, a, a like a, a, a real world example. So um, my my brother passed away about in 2018, about about three years ago in, in August. And I got him a, a couple policies and, and this company paid my family three hundred fifty thousand dollars. Right. He also had accidental coverage on his policy. Now he passed away because of, uh, of you know, an embolism in his brain, right? Something that was unseen. But what we looked at, cause he had a bunch, it would have been 500,000 with the accidental attached to it too, right? The reason I'm bringing this up is two weeks before he passed away, we were building a wall in my brother's backyard to, a retaining wall for his pool. And my oldest brother, it was funny as hell. I still remember this. He, he pushed the wheelbarrow into the wall and he, he tripped over the front of the wheelbarrow and he fell down the hill, right? He had a huge knot on his knee. Like it was like this big on his knee, right? right. And if that knot would have, would have caused a blood clot that led to that, you know, embolism or a stroke or something like that, that's considered accidental death. See where I'm going with that? Right. Correct. But in that case, it didn't contribute to my brother's death. So it didn't really pay out. But what I'm saying is there's other things that are considered accidents that lead to the death. Right. right. So hey, a lot of things that are considered accidents. Right. Hey man, I'm sorry to hear that, man. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. But that's the reason why I'm here. That's why I do this. You know, that's why I, 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 I teach training class. I, I teach all my agents to, 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 to better the world because I've seen it happen in my family. I know it happens everywhere else. For sure, man. Um, but anybody got any other questions on the uh, AD&D certificate? Nope. All right, cool. So we're going to go over the last no cost benefit, which is the, um, the will kit. Okay. So let me pop that up because I have it downloaded somewhere here. Boom. There we go. All right. Now you guys are going to want to look at the screen just because, um, it's a little bit better. It's a little bit easier to see. So if you guys want to switch your chair around, you can do that. If not, you can look at that way. Um, but the will kit. So when you're going over the will kit with them, the first thing I tell them is it's two parts. The will kit's two parts. So there is a workbook, which is blue. And then there is the kit documents, which is green. All right. So the workbook is designed for them to mess up to fix, to change, replace. The blue, one. the blue one is the workbook. It's designed for them to, to mess it up and fix it and change it. Once they finalize everything in the blue copy, they'll just transfer everything right over to the green copy, get it notarized and it's a will, right? So when I, when I show them this on the screen, I have the green copy on the screen because it, it shows them exactly what they put into it. Now, I know you guys can't really see it too well, but if I stop sharing this really quickly, you can see it. So this is the workbook. This is the blue workbook. Now, this is what the pages look like. This is one side, and then this is the other side. It's the same exact information from one page to the other, right? Except on this side, they show you how to do it, and they put examples in here. And then on this side is blank line. So these two pages are the same exact information. This shows you how to do it. This lets you fill it out, right? 
every page in the workbook works the same exact way. Now on the actual documents, the kit documents, there's no explanation. It's blank lines. All right. So I, when I walk them through this, I walk them through the actual documents, not the workbook. Because when they have the workbook, the answers to the questions are in the workbook, right? Oops. So the first page of the will is basically just a, just a disclaimer at the bottom. And then the second page is their actual name. The last will and my last will and testament, they'll put their name there, right? The the, and that's page two. Page three is where the will actually starts at. So the will was broken down into different articles. Now, the first part is just their information at the top, all right? Article number two, or I'm sorry, article number one is the identification of their family. So brothers, sisters, kids, wives. The reason why they have that in there is because later in the will, it refers to my spouse as. My spouse gets this, my kids get this. So when you refer to those people later down the road, this is where they're gonna name them. Does that make sense? Article number two is payments of debts and expenses. Article number two is pretty important. Article number two states that the executor is responsible for all the debts and the expenses of the estate. Okay. Most people don't know this. This is where people get into debt problems. So for an example, let's say, let's say, you know, I passed away and in my estate, my whole estate's worth 50 grand, right? And in that estate, I have 50,000 positive, And then I also owe $10,000 in credit cards and student loans and things like that, right? Now, my brother would be my executor. If my brother distributes that $50,000 to my family and doesn't pay off the 10,000, my brother's legally on the hook for that 10,000 now. So what he has to do is use that 50,000 to pay off the 10,000 and get 40,000 to the family. Does that make sense? The easy way to explain this to your members right here is all debts and expenses are the responsibility of the executor. All debts and all debts and expenses of the estate are the responsibility of the executor. So what that means is they should make sure that they know their executor knows this. This is, like I said, how people get into debt issues. Anybody got questions on article two? All right. All right. Article number three is what most people think about in a will. Leaving certain things to certain people. Article number three is disposition of property. So there are three different types of property you could leave people, three things. The first type of property you could leave to somebody is what's called a specific bequest. This is leaving somebody a car, the house, the jewelry, photo albums. You're gonna name the article that you're leaving, who it's gonna be distributed to and where they reside at, pretty simple. Now in the actual workbook, I think there's only like 13 spaces, 11 spaces, but in the actual will documents, you'll see there's 36, right? So if they're filling out the, the, the workbook and they run out of spaces, tell them to use a piece of paper. <laughs> use a line piece of paper, write it in and finalize everything over there, right? So anybody have questions on what, what the first type of property is? There, there's, there's four types of property you can leave with somebody. First type is specific bequests, right? The second type of property you could leave to somebody is what's called a digital asset, right? And that's on the next, next page here, the digital asset. Now a digital asset is anything that's either costing you money online or making you money online, right? It's becoming more and more popular. 
This is like Facebook, Instagram, Netflix, Hulu, YouTube, Spotify, you know, Shopify, Amazon. How many of you guys are members of those companies? A lot, of them, right? And if you died, does Netflix know you died? No. Netflix is just going to keep pulling that 15 bucks a month every single month out of your account until you tell them to stop it. All right? How many of those accounts do you guys have open? Quite a few. All right? So you got to basically in the work, in the workbook itself, it, it'll, it'll say schedule a is where you're going to put all that information at schedule a is in the back. The last page is schedule a and it's not, I think it's even in here. Workbook. Yeah, it's okay. Schedule A looks like this. I don't know if you guys can see it, but it basically has the websites that they visit, the name of the site, how to access it, username and password. All right. All I tell people at that point, a, a, a digital asset is something that's either costing you money online or making you money online. So things like Netflix, Hulu, Shopify, Amazon, you know, Facebook, all that good stuff. So they're going to nominate someone to take care of that stuff for them. Anybody have questions on that type of property? Pretty easy. All right. Uh, the next type of property is called remaining tangible personal property. And that's just a fancy word for saying cleaning up the rest of the house. Dishes, pots, Tupperware, clothing, furniture, all that stuff has to be moved out of the house. They're going to nominate one person to take care of everything at that point. That's where you see estate sales, yard sales, things like that happen. Getting arrested of all, getting rid of rest of all this stuff that doesn't hold intrinsic value to your family. All right. Any got anybody have questions on that? Pretty simple there too. All right. And then the fourth type of property is what's called the residuary estate. The residuary estate is anything you have tied up in 401ks, Roth IRAs, investments, cryptocurrency, anything like that. At that point, they're gonna, your family's gonna split it up by percentage. So it'll all be in one bulk area. That's called your estate, right? And they're gonna split that estate up by percentages. And on the screen, you can see there's like six lines. You can put the name of the person and what percentage they're gonna get. One thing I want you guys to note here and tell our members is that if this does not add up to 100%, the judge could throw the will out for incompetence. Because you did not fill out the will right, he can throw that out. Because you can't add up to 100, this might not be a legal document. Does that make sense to you guys? Pretty simple. All right. Anybody got questions on disposition of property? Okay. All right. Article number four and article number five. These are the guardians or the executors of the will. Article number four is you're going to nominate two personal representatives or executors for this will. You're going to nominate one person at the top there, and then they make a, a surrogate or a contingent at the next part. Article number five is the nomination of digital executor. So someone to take care of all the digital assets. They can be the same person. They don't have to be different people, right? But everybody got one person in their family that's way better at computers and technology than everybody else, right? Like if this was my family, my youngest brother would be on there because he's a freaking computer whiz. I would be nowhere near that because I hate computers. I hate technology, right? So I don't even put the time of day to put into it. But I'd probably be, in my family, probably be the, the number one executor because I feel like I'm the most responsible. Right? So they can be different people. They don't have to be the same people. But just nominate the executor and the digital executor there. All right? All right. Now, article number six is the nomination of guardian. This would only come into play if this person that we're doing the will for is the guardian of anybody under the age of 18. All right? So if they're, if they're the guardian of somebody under the age of 18 and they pass away, they need to know who this kid is going to go to. If there's nobody listed on here, that kid goes into the system. 
right? He's in Child Protective Services, right? I, I don't know if you guys know how that works. So if my wife and I were killed and we didn't have nothing set up, this kid wouldn't go to my mother or her mother? Unless you listed that on some kind of legal documents. The reason why is because the judge doesn't know your mother from some stranger down the street. It's not just going to give your mother custody. Does that make sense? So it's going to be long court battles. The whole time you're in that court battle, though, where's the kid at? Right? So, and it's not a quick process. They can go into the system pretty quickly to get out of it. Not a quick process. And they don't play favorites and, and keep kids together. They don't keep brothers together and sisters together. They try to. Not every time that happens, though. I'm sure you guys have heard stories of family splitting up because of that. So all I tell our members is if you're the guardian of anybody under the age of 18, make sure you put someone who can take care of that kid on that line, right? And then the section below that is pet guardian. Same thing. You know, our pets are like our kids, right? I just, I just lost my dog yesterday, like my best friend, you know? So at that point, if I died, I want to make sure someone takes care of my dog. Because if not, guess what? He's going to the animal shelter. And my dog was old. He wasn't going to last long there, you know? So making sure that you put the pet guardians on there. And you can just ask them, you guys have any pets? No, don't worry about it. Okay, you don't have to go through it, right? Those two are pretty easy to go through. If they don't have it, don't even go through it with them. Make sense? Keep it easy on yourselves, All right? Uh, the next article that's on there is article number seven. Or that's, that's eight, sorry, article number eight. <laughs> article number eight is the personal representative's powers, what they can and can't do. There's nothing to fill out there, just some legal jargon. Have them read through it, right? It just lets them know what the executor can and can't do, okay? Article number 10 is special directives. This is where they're going to put down, or sorry, uh, sorry, article number 10 is executor powers. Same thing, so sorry, article number eight and article number nine are the digital powers and the personal representative's powers, what they can and can't do, right? Now, article 11, or sorry, article 10 is special Directives, article number 10. Special directives are anything you want done after you pass away. I wanna be buried at this funeral home. I wanna be, I want these kind of flowers there, right? Everything that you want done at that point. So what funeral home they wanna to go to, how they wanna be laid out, what kind of clothing they wanna wear, uh, any kind of guests they wanna invite, any kind of guests they don't wanna be there. Um, I also tell people at this point too, you can list your life insurance company in here as well. I have life insurance through this company. Here's the pulse number. I tell them that. It's a good, it's a good, you can put that down there. Why not? That way, and that's another way to find out if they have life insurance or not. If you forget to ask in the family information guide, you can ask it here. By the way, do you, do you have any permanent life insurance in force? You do? Okay, you would put that down on that spot there. Pretty simple. That way you know. All right. Um, so anybody have questions so far? I know I'm kind of flying through this. The good thing about this though, guys, is, um, I want you to, at the end of this chat, at the end of this year, put your email address in the chat because I have a video, um, that will go over the will kit for you guys. And it's actually the guy who designed it. His name is Mark Zipper. He goes over a long version of it. So like 25 minutes of explaining it. And then he goes over a five to 10 minute version of it. You can do in the house. That's how I learned how to do this. So watch that video once I get once we get done here. That's your homework tonight. Cool. So I'll give everybody that video so you have access to it. All right. So if I'm going through this quick, don't worry because he's going to go over it very slowly for you. All right. Um, but like I was saying, Article 11 is just a bunch of miscellaneous provisions as well. You can take a couple minutes to read through those. I do just tell them if it's legal jargon. Take a, take a look into it. Why is he clicking? Because oh, I'm drawing on it. You're all drawings. You don't say it. Get out of this. Come on. We gotta get your brother in here. I know. Like, what's going on here? Where's he at? There we go. Okay. There we go. All right. So the next page, this is where they're going to sign this and have a notary sign this. So they're gonna sign this at the top, and they're gonna have a notary sign it at the bottom. What they also need, though, is two witnesses. Witnesses should not be 
friends, family members, anybody involved in this will, they should be strangers. The witnesses have no legal recourse for this will at all. All they're saying is that the person that filled out this will is not the same person that notarized it. That's it, right? So what I tell my members to do- Do you have to take them witnesses with you when you get it notarized? Good question, right? So what I tell our members to do is I ask them what bank they, they bank at. Another way to figure out what bank they have. So an easy way to do this, Mary and Joe, what bank do you guys use? You use PNC Bank? Perfect. Well, I know we work with PNC and I know that PNC Bank has a notary public on hand. And what they'll do is they'll just grab two bank tellers as witnesses. Or they'll grab two people in line and tell them to be witnesses. What if they don't want the credit union or something? Every bank or, or credit institution has, by law, somebody that is notarized on staff. They have to. Right? If, if you don't have a bank, if they don't have a bank, they can go to a notary public. They can go to, uh, um, what's the name of that, like, check cashing place? Western, Western Union has one. Um, they can also go to, check. like, any, what was that? I think it's currency exchange, cashier's check. I remember yep. for notaries. All those places can do it. They all have notary publics on hand. So do like the the town halls for the of these eight of these places. All the town halls, most of their secretaries are notary publics. The only thing about that is you got to find two witnesses with you. So that's why I tell them keep it easy. Who do you guys bank with? Bank with that? Okay, great. They actually have a notary public on hand. Take it there. Get two get two witnesses and a notary sign it. All right. Um, any questions on that? Any other questions? That was a very good question, by the way. Any other questions? Nope. All right. Now, this will kit is a will and a living will. So it's both. Now, do you guys know the difference between a will and a living will? No? Okay. Yeah, will, right. will is, a living will is medical. It's like... A will is a will and a living will is, I'm a little confused actually. I thought I knew it. It's you're, medical. In you're on the right, Nick, you're on the right track, man. You're <laughs> on the right track. You're on the right track, man. So yes. So a, a will takes care of things when you pass away. A living will comes into place when you're not able to function for yourself. So if you're in a persistent vegetative state, you have a terminal condition, an end state condition, or you're just not able to speak, act, or think for yourself, but you're still alive, right? So that's when this would kick in. The living will, and it says it right here, the living will, oops, the living will only kicks in if you are both mentally and physically incapacitated and had a terminal condition, an end state condition, or in a persistent vegetative state. That's when this would kick in. Right, so this is a pretty, pretty easy thing to explain to them as well. Um, when you're going over the living will, just let them know when you're in this, if you're in this situation where you can't think or act for yourself, who do you wanna be in charge of that, right? So you can see there's, there's not really any articles on this part, it's just letters. Um, letter A is what, it goes, what goes into it, when, you can do, when they can use it. Letter, letter B is nutrition and hydration if they want to be kept on feeding tubes or breathing tubes, right? Number C, or letter C, number C. <laughs> letter C is pregnancy. If they are pregnant, what they want done with the kid, right? And then D at the bottom is other requests. So there's a blank spot there. What you can recommend for them to put in there is things like, um, because of my religion, I do not receive, I, I do not want to have blood transfusions or um, do not put me on the you know, breathing machine, or I do not want to be resuscitated, things like that will go in there, right? Um, or like, I don't want to receive chemotherapy or any kind of uh, experimental medications. All that stuff will go on that line, right? What they don't want done. Um, the next section uh, where it says two there, that's where you're gonna designate the healthcare surrogate. So you're gonna need one person as the primary, and then there's gonna be two backups. So the primary would go up at the top there, and then two backups would go down under section D there. So it says first alternate surrogate, second alternate surrogate. That's a backup for, for the executor, for the uh, living will section of it. 
Okay. You, you would use that second or third person. Yes, correct. Um, and then Article B there, it's just what, what, what powers the surrogate has and doesn't have. Take, I have them take a couple minutes to read through it. And then C would be the limitations. So like what they can't do. Um, once again, it's things like do not, a DNR. Um, there's a couple other things in here. Blood transfusions. It's more or less for them to put down their, their beliefs at that point, right? And then, uh, and then the next page after that would be where they would, um, once again, sign this and have a, a notary public actually uh, sign it as well. So I'm gonna flip over to that next section here. Boom, you'll see it. So you'll see general provisions again, just a couple other things, legal jargon they can read through, and then they'll have themselves sign it, notary sign it, and two witnesses. They can be the same witnesses from the other one. So my suggestion to our members is get this all filled out, everything ready to go, take it to the bank, get it notarized, and it's done. All right. Now, the last page on it, that's that Schedule A that I was showing you. That's where you would put all of the websites that they visited, right? That that one shut down. The last thing I do with them, well, sec second to last thing I do with them is I tell them, once you finalize the blue version of this, or the, sorry, once you finalize the green version of this, what they're going to do is they're actually going to take this and they're going to make four copies of it. Four, right? First copy, they're actually going to keep with them at the house. Second copy, they're going to give to their executor or executrice. Third copy, they're going to give to their lawyer or attorneys. And then the fourth copy, they're going to keep with their health care provider. So their doctor. So more than one person has access to the same information. Does that make sense? All right. Um, and in the, in, the, in the actual workbook too, the first page in the workbook is a checklist. So I tell them, if you, once you knock off everything on this checklist, then you can finalize everything in the green copy. All right. Now, just like all the other no cost benefits guys, what's the last step? Collecting referrals. This is a very, very easy program to get referrals from. Very easy. So Mary and Joe, you know, do you have any questions on how the will would help you guys out? No, we're good, okay. So, you know, be, because, you know, we're, we're trying to get these out and help out everybody in the community with these, um, you know, the program, they're, they're allowing you to sponsor a total of five people to receive their will kits as well. So they don't have to pay any money to go get it notarized or to, to go to a, a lawyer and, and have a law team and take time doing it, right? So they actually get free will kits just like you did. So who do you know that has been talking about a will? You know, cause to be honest with you guys, most people that get a will, it's not the first time they talked about it. They've been bouncing the ideas off a couple other people, right? So just get those people those names. like. Will kit, will kit uh, referrals are great. Like I would never tell you guys to sleep on a will kit lead or referral. Number one. You said make four copies. One was to the executor, one was to the lawyer, and who were the other two? Uh, so, okay, four copies. Keep a copy at the house. Keep a copy with your executor or executrice. Law team or attorneys. And then your healthcare provider, your doctor. So they have it on file there. And what I was saying with the will kits is, you're, yeah, they're going to be older. They're going to be an older generation. They're going to be older people, right? But the thing about it is they're planning for their future. And a lot of times planning, they got to have a backup plan. That's life insurance, right? And a lot of people are going to run into, you're either going to run into two people. One person that has everything covered, and this is the last thing they need. Second people you're going to run to is this is the first thing they looked into and they need everything else. We're going to provide everything else, that life insurance form, right? So I would say will kits are probably 50-50. They're some of the best leads in the company. They're very hot leads too. Once we get will kits in, we, we basically shoot the leads right out to the agents. Some of, my, some of my guys or girls have been calling will kits that came out last week or two days ago. 
So I would tell you never sleep on the wheel kits. Yeah. Matt Jan sold one the other day, 1200 ALP. Lady had nothing. You're going to run into people like that. And as long as we're, guys, remember, as long as we're providing expertise and walking them through this and answering their questions, they know we're on their side, right? You've heard this a million times and you're going to hear it a million more times down the road. These people, they don't care how much you know. They don't. They only, care, they only, know, they, they only know how much you care. Does that make sense? So if you care about their family, they're going to be willing to do a lot of things that if they see that you don't care, you're trying to just get through this, they're going to shut you down. So putting your effort into this, putting your sincerity into this, right? Putting What helps me a lot is I put myself in their shoes. If I was in their situation, how would I feel with someone presenting this to me, right? But I mean, other than that, I don't really have anything else to, for you guys to go over. I mean, what time is it now? It's right on time, three o'clock. How about that? Um, but I got a couple extra minutes. If you guys have any questions for me about anything, I'm more than happy to answer them for you. Are we able to get a copy of the will kit? Yeah, we, we have them in the office here. This is the first time seeing them. Okay, yeah, Casey has them. I'll give them to you. They're, they're broken down by MGA because these are hot commodities right now. So we don't have too many of them. We're actually getting a big shipment of them in soon, though. So that's good. Um, but guys, have any other questions for me at all? Anything like that? All right. Before you all leave the room, make sure you put your email address in the chat so I can send you guys the video. Okay. All right. Thank you guys for hanging out with me today. I hope you guys learned some things. I know it was a lot of information to go over. Keep in mind those three things, making it important to them, explaining it and collecting referrals, right? I'm going to let you know a lot of the time referrals though, they come from building rapport. Don't skip out on rapport. I'd say a solid rapport is anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes, right? Get to know them. But other than that, guys, you know, um, if, you, if you need me, let me know. Um, you can get my phone number from your MGAs. Call me if you need anything. I'm here for you guys as, as, as a leader. Um, I'll help everybody in this, in this office that needs anything from me. So um, other than that, I'll see you guys on Wednesday. I'm running the training class with you guys on Wednesday. So we'll see you there. But, Let's get uh, it, Drew. But have some fun today on the phones. Let's get out there and protect some members. And let's yes, get sir. excited. I know we all got team meetings coming up. So let's get in there. And then we'll, uh, we'll be able to help out some families tonight. But, but make sure you guys put your uh, emails in the chat, okay? Thank you. Thank you. We'll do. Thank right, you. Guys. See you, guys. Bye. All right, my man.